What's good, people? How y'all feeling, man? Um, <clears throat> Monday morning quarterback back at you after that horrific Eagles loss, loss yesterday to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But before I get into it, um, this this is a this is a pretty rough day because we all, well, at least myself and people in the sports community, specifically bas- basketball, as well as people that have been affected affected in a positive way by him when he shed his light on them. When he shed his light on them, um, Dikembe Mutombo passed away today at the age of, I believe, was it 53 or 54? He just passed away from uh, a long battle with brain cancer. And it's, it's really, man, excuse me, 58. Still too young, man. Um, so young. So young. Um, we obviously know him from in the area from being a Philadelphia 70, 76er, man. He was a an integral part of that championship run where we ultimately lost to the Lakers. You know, not a championship run, but, you know, we, we went to the championship. And I remember Theo Rat- Ratliff. You know, this is story time here. I remember Theo Ratliff being a borderline star leading up into that season and then in 2001 he finally turned that corner from just being a defensive stalwart to adding a little bit of offense to his his game I think he might have had like a little jumper or or hook shot or something like that and and it it took him to the next level and we were looking very 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 strong we started off like 13 and 0 something something to that extent we we were undefeated for like the first 10 to 12 games or something like that we were we were rolling and that was for Allen Iverson, Theo Ratliff, Tyrone Hill, George Lynch and Eric Snow in the starting lineup and then Eric Aaron McKee was your sixth man and I remember later in that season we thought we were going to definitely go to the finals and then Theo Ratliff well we didn't know we were definitely going to go to the finals but we knew we had something different th- that year and Theo Ratliff got injured and he was out for the year and we were like, oh crap, what are we going to do now? You don't have a big man. And um, Billy King, I think, was it Billy King? It might have been Billy King was the GM at the time. And he went out and um, traded for Dikembe Mutombo. And I remember at the time, he, he was just going past his prime, or he might have been past his prime at that point, but he was still a very, very good player and a great defender and he came in and he helped to add to the tone that Allen Iverson set he was that other stabilizing presence that you didn't have Theo Ratliff was a young rising talent but he wasn't an established veteran and he didn't he didn't have the cachet or, or the experience to know what it's like to you know play in, in high pressure situations when when people are expecting you to to get things done like he hadn't been there yet the Kemba Matumbo he was known for the finger wag no 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 not today that's what people knew him for on the court they knew him as a shot blocker and a tenacious defender right so when he came in here he was like a, a perfect compliment to Allen so all he had to do was come down the court shake some people and if they wanted to put two on one or three on one on, on Allen, then he could just alley oop it to to Matumbo, or or just having Matumbo there added a little bit of spacing for Eric Snow to get easy jump shots from the free throw line. So you know he re- he really changed the the identity of this team. I think he he added to it a certain level of maturity because Allen Iverson, mind you, you know he was he almost got traded before the season started. People like was it Pat Croce? Larry Brown wanted his ass gone. And I think it was Pat Croce that convinced Larry Brown to give Allen Iverson one more chance. And they kept him. And Allen Iverson vowed to be a different person. And he came out and he ran that season and got MVP that year. But Dikembe Mutombo, he was like the, um, mm, man, he, he, was, he was like the uh, garlic bread to a nice pasta dish. Like, the pasta dish can be fire without it. But if you have some good garlic bread... Pfft, Chef's kiss and to come in the tumbo, he gave us that energy and that presence. And he was just fun, man. He fit the city, man. Like, and you could just see he was a good dude. And it really, I don't ever, I, I typically don't make videos, you know, after people pass. I, I might put up a story and give them their flowers there. Um, but 
but um, he he meant a lot to the city. He he, he really did, and um and, and more so, he meant a lot to people. Like he 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 influenced the world, especially especially when he he went back to Africa and um he he would help out his home his home um country, you know, the Republic of Congo. He you know I was reading, I didn't know he did all these things. Like he built a hospital there. And since he built it, I think half a million people have gotten uh care there regardless if if they've been able to pay for it or not. Like things like that. And then you see like Daryl Morey, the current president of the Sixers right now, who I didn't even know was the GM of the Rockets when Matama was down there, whether Matama was still playing or in the front office. And he said, look, Daryl Morey, this is his words. I'm reading the ESPN article. There aren't many guys like him, Morey said. Just a great human being. When I was a rookie GM in this league, my first chance in Houston, he was somebody I went to all the time. His accomplishments on the court, we don't need to talk about too much. Just an amazing human being. What he did off the court for Africa, rest in peace to Kembe. And he was saying he was having tears in his eyes when he asked him about it at the media day. And Joel Embiid was speaking on this today too. Joel Embiid was talking about, look, he, you, you know those people that are... None of us are per perfect. We're all human beings. We do great things. We do bad things. We're flawed and we're loved. But, you know, there are certain people where, you know, we lost somebody special today. And, you know, no, no disrespect. I don't think he's special because he's doing anything otherworldly. I think he's special because he's doing what God intended for us to do on this earth in a, t a day and age when, when most people are selfish and only care about themselves and instant self-gratification. And when you, when you have people like this, you know, like like uh, Dikembe Mutombo, like a Betty White, um, uh, it, I, I'm just throwing things off the top of my head. People that just are a joy, they bring life and they speak life into people. When you lose people like that, it hits different, man. I don't know about you, but it hits different for me and it hits different for a lot of people. Um, I know those type of people around the way and when you lose them, it's, it's different. Um, my cousin over here says, excellent analogy. Uh, Look, that's just the way I felt. That's the way I see it. And um, look, I just want to give people their flowers when they're on this earth and continue to do so when they transition to wherever their next destination in their journey in this universe is. Um, exactly. Just like Momo. Just like Ida Conaway. Um, you know, when you lose people that are special, it hits different. So honestly, and this is unrelated to sports, is, is um, I think it's incumbent upon all of us, important for all of us to try to be the best versions of ourselves and help each other because we're all brothers and sisters, whether we realize it or not, you know, rant over. Um, I hope that um, you guys watching have somebody in your life that's as special as the Kembe was to a lot of the people that interacted with him. And hopefully you're doing the same thing. Ida Conaway, Aunt Mary Barnett. I still have the uh, the knitted the knitted quilt, um, not quilt, um, the hat and scarf that she made for me when I was a kid. Like you don't forget those things. You know, I could have all the money in the world. I could be you know publishing papers for my PhD, but you know once I find it, I still I still be sitting with that knitted sweater just like just like this, like I was you know five years old again because that you don't forget the foundation. So, um, rest in peace to Ken Bay, and, you know, I, I want, I'm going to say a prayer tonight for his family and, and his loved ones because, you know, just like he's been there for others, this is the time to be here for him. And, and you know, not just him, just in general. When you see people suffering in pain, you know, show them some light, man. You'll be surprised how you can change somebody's day and somebody's life. Uh, I guess it's kind of fitting being the end of, um, uh, you know, things I can't say, um, self-deletion awareness month. I'll just put it like that. Um, you know, just give a smile, give a kind word to people, and you'd be surprised how that will come back to you in the present or, or down on, down the line in life. You know what I'm saying? So um, with that being said, um, I'm going to go ahead and kind of like finish off talking about the Sixers. And Bede, he mentioned at that same press conference today that um, – he he cut I think twenty to twenty five pounds in the off season, and I, I want to segue this into a point. He was on that USA team in the Olympics that went over there in France. They got the gold. Everybody remembers Steph Curry, you know, having that signature game. LeBron James, you know, putting on the cape, in, in you know 
especially at a time where we almost lost, I think, to Serbia. Yeah. And then Joel Embiid going the hell off in that game against Serbia as well. But I think Embiid, he got a chance to be around Steph Curry and LeBron. They've won. They've been top-level players at the highest level. And he got to see the intensity, how even in the Olympics, it's a different level. It's like whatever they got to do to win within reason to get there. And I think he's seeing that. And hence... The weight loss and just a different attitude. You could see it in his eyes when he was over there um, uh, playing in, in the Olympics. You could see it. The, the, the demeanor. It, it, it's like it. he had it. Like, I'm not saying he didn't have it. But to be around peers that can match that energy. Because he hasn't had that in Philly. Tyrese Maxey is the first person to really match that energy. But now he's around other peers on the world stage that bring that same energy. I think it hit him different. And that I, I think you're really seeing him... He spoke. He's locked in. I'm telling you, watch out for him. That's that's a a, a fun thing to watch this October. Watch him be. I think you're going to be surprised. Uh, let me know what you guys think. Um, if you're ready for the MLB, uh, the NBA season. Um, oh, this was the last day of the season for Major League Baseball, and the Braves got in because they split their doubleheader with the New York Mets. So the Mets are in. And I forgot who they're playing. Diamondbacks are out. And then the Braves are going to play the Padres in the first round. And we have the bye, obviously. So we'll, we'll see what happens after that. But, man, very, very um, interesting day. I'll put it like that. And then lastly, I'm going to end off with I'm going to keep it brief. I'm going to keep it short because there's really not much to say in this angry rant that I'm about to give. I'm going to give you two plays from the first drive that stuck out to me. And I want you guys to know exactly what I think. And you know what? You know, uh, moving forward, I have a whiteboard over here. And I'm going to start drawing up plays on there. You know, I've, I've been trying to think of ways to, to um, you know, show what, I, what I'm thinking and, sh and show what I think is going wrong and how they can fix it. So I'm going to start, you know, drawing up players on the, on the whiteboard and showing you exactly where I think they're messing up and where they can get better. But nonetheless, that first drive in that Eagles game against the Bucks, when they were on when they were on defense, you had Baker Mayfield go, I think, seven plays, 79 yards, something like that, and they just shredded the defense. And... And and what what really what really stood out to me was how far the cornerbacks were playing off their wide receivers, uh, Chris Godwin and uh, Mike Evans, and and even number ten I can't remember his name. One play on that drive, you have first and ten I think around the Eagles forty yard line, you know in, in Eagles territory, and they're in. They have um, Mike Evans on the left side of the field, and they have. Uh, number 10 on the right side of the field. They bring, I mean, they have Mike Evans on the right, number 10 on the left. They bring number 10 in motion, and they immediately see that, okay, it's going to be zone. Queen Yon Mitchell is already like five to seven yards off the ball, and instead of following him, he passes him off to the next person, and Reed Blankenship picks up Mike Evans, and then either Slay or Queen Yon Mitchell, whoever on the other side, picks up number 10. And they keep max protection. They keep everybody in the block, and they just send two wide receivers out on a route. Mike Evans and number 10. They, they do a concept. It's, the smash concept is where you have a uh, – let me get my hands right here. <laughs> when you have a hook route on the, um, on the outside receiver, and then you have an, uh, a route to the sideline. So the, the hook route is meant to keep – um, one of the cornerbacks or somebody playing the flat and then this route is meant to drive the cornerback off and then when you slant out to the sideline you should have a window right here to throw the ball and in this particular play instead of doing the hook route this number 10 he ran straight so he took the the cornerback all the way up and then all Mike Evans had to do was beat Blankenship to the corner which was not hard for him to do and the fact that we had uh, we had a four-man rush from that play, and they had Max protect, and he was, and they only sent two people out on a route, and they were able to easily get a completion. It seems like these guys aren't prepared. The touchdown play. This is the second play I'm going to pick out. The stu I'm not. I don't even care about the Rashad White one with the tip ball down the sideline. That that happens. We, we're not going to blame them for that. 
So let's look at the touchdown. They had this played pretty well. And for those that are looking at Slay, I don't know what other people are saying or if analysts are saying something different, but this is what I see. I think Slay played that very, very well. I think he was playing outside technique. He's playing on the receiver's outside hip and allowing him to go inside. You know why? Because he thought N'Kobe Dean was going to be taking away the middle of the field. But what happened, N'Kobe Dean got caught with his eyes in the backfield and he took a step up to, to follow whatever receiver or running back was in the flat who was already being covered by an Eagles defender. And that split second is where number 10 broke um, to the post in the middle of the field and N'Kobe Dean couldn't recover. He tried to put his hand up to tip the ball. It didn't work. And Slay had outside position and could not get around and knock down the ball. If N'Kobe Dean doesn't get caught with his eyes in the backfield, he either tips that ball or he's in position to pick it off if, if Baker Mayfield doesn't see him standing there. These, these things, these are the little details. How is this team not prepared? Please explain to me. And we, we've, seen, we've been complaining about this all last year, and now we're seeing it this year, but even worse. No pass rush. Bryce Huff, non-existent. I don't even know if he started uh, yesterday. I don't think he did. I think Nolan Smith was starting instead of him. You get no pass rush because they're hit, they're doing quick hitters because you're seven ball uh, seven uh, yards off the ball. Why are you seven yards off the ball when it's first and ten? Like as the coordinator, if you're calling that, what are you doing? And even so, if you're the player. Even if it's called, why are you going to stand that far off the ball? Darius Slay, still pretty close to that 4-3-8 speed. Quinion Mitchell, a 4-3-3 guy. You really think these guys are going to get beat over the top? Are you really that afraid? If you, Even if you're playing cover two, or where you have them sitting in a, a cloud flat, or a, a soft squat zone, do you really think that Unless it's like Tyreek Hill, they're going to blow past them through the coverage. If they're playing cover three and they're just trying not to get beat over the top, why can't they just be like three yards off the ball? They're going to beat them to the spot anyway. Like these these little nuances. And if, you, and if I'm the player, I'm like, I'm not going to be 10 yards off the ball. One, I can't go up to stop the run, especially if it's a toss play. Two, I can't stop it if it's a screen. Just because they don't have somebody in the slot doesn't mean he can't still run a screenplay. Hell, they might run a screenplay to the tight end. And now the receivers up the field, they, they're blocking me 10 yards down deep in the uh, 10 yards past the line of scrimmage. And now now I got um, uh, Otten, uh, their, their tight end, running free. You know, with, with a, a parade of elephants going on the sideline. Like, like, the, the, it, it is elementary things. These things aren't rocket science. Um, you don't need to be an NFL uh, level coordinator to be able to pick these, th these things out. These are things that we would be privy to even when I played PB football. We knew these things. When I played PB football or even backyard football, if I know I'm faster than the wide receiver in front of me, even if I'm trying to play zone and, and keep him from taking the top off, why would I go seven yards off, off of him versus... Um, either being right up on him and pressing him or, or even just being like three or four yards off so I can I can easily adjust to the slant without getting off balance and over committing and, and trying to take a gamble it, it's it's not that difficult let me know what you guys think but it, but you know until these things change things aren't going to get no better and then on offense you know you have Rain Johnson now on the right side. You don't have any of your receivers in. Everybody knows the ball is going to Dallas Goddard and Jahan Dotson when they can get him open. And, and Saquon Barkley is going to be the guy that they circle um, in the defensive room during the week. We, we know that, right? We knew Vita Vader was, com Vita Vader was coming back, and he's just an anchor in the middle. But here's the thing. At a certain point, you just have to keep running the ball. You have to say, this is the play that's coming. We're going to run it, and that's it. That's the end of it. Because here's the thing, the longer you keep them on the field, the more tired you get a guy like Vita Vea, the less his um, his ability to be an anchor in the middle becomes relevant. Because once them legs start going, now all of a sudden, instead of him stuffing the run for one yard or negative one yard, now all of a sudden, oh, two yards happened. And then a couple of plays later, oh, now you ran for three or four. And, and then, then you start to crack the code. But like you, you can't just like 
throw a little jab, and then go run around. You, you, you can't ever establish any type of momentum or get people's respect that way. No, you have to, at a certain point, you got to step. At a certain point, you just got to step. People try to make football too complicated. Instead of going back to, look, the 49ers, regardless of what you think of them, they keep it simple. Kyle Shanahan keeps it simple. Simple. They're running. You know they're going to run, whether they have Christian McCaffrey in there or not. That's what they do, and they will do that, right? It's, you, they have an identity, and they stick to it. They will live by that and die by that. And but love them or hate them, ironically, that gives you the best chance to win in this uh, pass-happy league, right? But, you know, that that's that's neither here nor there. Let me know what you guys think about that and and um, how you think the Eagles will address these issues going into the bye week. And then lastly, the Raiders. Look, I, I was looking at the game yesterday. Um, uh, you know, it, it was, you know, we're limited, right? As soon, you have Devontae Adams out. It's a similar situation. To what we got going on with the Eagles. You, you knew Jacoby Myers was the target. And Brock Bowers. So Brock Bowers was the gotter to, to the Raiders. And then you know Jacoby Myers was the Jahan Dotson for the Raiders. Like They're, they're cool. But it's, it, it made it very, very difficult. But what's, what was even sweeter is that the Browns are an absolute crap show right now. They're a dumpster fire. Them, do, them dudes are so bad. Them dudes are so bad. It's almost like they hate... Um, Deshaun Watson, the way that they, it's like people just get free hits on this dude all the time. It's like they, the right tackle, I think it was third down, they didn't even block block homie coming off the edge. And Deshaun Watson had a touchdown pass, um, it might have been to Amari Cooper, yeah, it was to Amari Cooper, and he was wide open, wide as day. He couldn't turn all the way around on his throw because he got hit. He got hit so quick, and he got up, and he was freaking screaming. I think it was a rookie right tackle. He was screaming at this dude, and on the sideline, excuse me, uh, go look up Brown's highlights or just look up just showing Watson, Watson angry on the sideline. He was yelling at this dude. They had to, like, hold him back from dude, and then at a certain point, he, I guess they both calmed down, and he went up behind him, and he was talking to him. He's like, yo, like, but... Man, they are so dysfunctional. So we ended up beating them twenty to sixteen, and and somehow the Eagles and the Raiders are both two and two. Even though the Eagles are clearly a better team than the Raiders, the Raiders we have certain things we like to do, and we just do them. Okay, so we we've, we've held it, we lost twenty two ten to the Chargers in the first week. Second week we upset the Ravens twenty six twenty three. Last week we got I guess upset by the Panthers. Because they took Bryce Young out, and now they actually have a functional quarterback throwing the ball. So go figure, Deontay Johnson just looked like a superstar again. And we, we just didn't have no answers for that dude. Um, he went off for my fantasy team, but I, I didn't want to see it for that reason. Don't, don't go off when you're playing my team. And then this week, Amari Cooper, I don't know if he's hearing footsteps. He's like He dropped a, an easy pass. He, he dropped one off it. One bounced off his hands and I think caused an interception. It, like he had a touchdown. Like don't get don't get don't get it twisted. He had a touchdown, but man, he 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 man. I don't know what's going on with him. It's, it's just odd. And um, beyond that, they ain't, they ain't had nothing on offense, and we were running on their defense. That's what shocked me. Like because Zamir White been he had like under three yards of carry or something like that, and he was he was doing pretty decent. I, I was actually I'm sitting here watching him just like. You know, just go through through like the you know the A gap, B gap, like and and and, and get to the second level. I, I was just like, okay, all right, you know, just keep doing that. I'm not going to get on your case. I'm not going to complain. We'll take that. Okay, Alexander Madison, five carries, sixty yards, twelve yards to carry. Stupid. That's crazy. That's crazy money. And Zamir White, seventeen carries for fifty yards, two point nine. Yards per carry, but he had a 17 yarder, and I think he might have had uh, maybe like two or three other pretty pretty nice runs. So, um, and then DJ Turner, one one carry, 18 yards, touchdown. Maybe that was the end of the round. Yeah, that was the end of the round by DJ Turner. I think that was the first touchdown actually too. Man, he was freaking flying around that corner. So I, I'm very very interested to see what he looks like moving forward, man. They, they can they they can do some special things moving him around the formation like a chess piece, man. That dude got he's quick, 
Like he got a first step. That's crazy. And um, look, I I'm proud of this team, man. To be two and two, you know, our coach, our fearless leader, Antonio Pierce. He used to be a New York Giant, but you know what? We're gonna forget about his transgressions. And he he's the coach that we needed in Las Vegas. He he really is. Like he he fits our culture and he holds people accountable. And that's why I think we're at where we're at. Let me go ahead and read these uh, comments here. Um, uh, Ryan's here. What's going on, brother? Um, you know, as, as, as my co-host, you know what I mean? He, he, he's on here dropping knowledge all the time. And he says, every time you feed Saquon, you see what he does. Like, like you said, it's not rocket science because when you're missing your best receivers, you have to find a way to get that man involved. Plain and simple. Also, Jalen and Nick seem to have a disconnect based off Jalen's presser. I got to see the presser. I didn't watch it, but that's, that's an interesting comment. I, um, I'm not surprised. I put it like that. And it. I hope this doesn't snowball into something uh, more nefarious. Um, but, yeah, people in the comments, let me let me know, um, you know, once I post this on YouTube, let me know what you guys think of what I said, you know, first starting off with Dikembe and talking about his legacy and what he meant to the city of Philadelphia and just um, his family and, and, and his global presence, period. And then, um, you know, the Phillies and... And what, what, who you hope to face in the second round? Because the Braves are in the playoffs now. They didn't get knocked out. I was hoping they were too. Um, Braves and the Mets are in. And then let me know what you think about the Sixers, Joel Embiid, his thoughts from the Kembe, as well as the weight loss, because that's what everybody's been on this case about. And then lastly, that debacle with the Eagles, and then the ray of sunshine I had with the Raiders. I, I was pretty. I wasn't angry. I wasn't angry with the Eagles' loss because. Um, why, why, why? At this point, why, why get angry about uh, things that keep happening? But that Raiders victory really just boosted my spirits. I, I just, I, I was, I was pretty happy. I, I, I just did not care as much. Um, but let me know what you guys think about that, and I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.